In this video, we're moving on from our discussion about covenants. And specifically, in the last video, we were talking about specific principles when it comes to enforcing covenants. And in this video, we're going to be talking mainly about the passing of the burden to successors in titles. And then in our final video on covenants, we'd be looking at passing the benefit of the covenant. So, passing the burden to successors in title. How does the burden pass? There are a few simple and absolute rules. Okay, so first, it is not possible for the burden of a covenant between freeholders to run at law in any circumstances. So it can only run at equity. There can be no claim at law against a successor to the original covenant law. And you can see that in Roan and Stevens in 1994. If a burden is to run at all, it must run at equity. This means that any claim is subject to all the usual general requirements for the enforcement of a claim at equity. Any award is discretionary, the interest must be appropriately registered, and you must come with clean hands. Second, even in equity, only the burden of restrictive covenants is capable of passing, and this is an absolute rule. The burden of positive covenants never passes. It is not possible for the burden of a positive covenant to be enforced against a successor in title. Only the original covenant tour can be liable in respect of a positive covenant. So this is very, very important. Make sure you remember this. And despite some criticism of this rule, there is no doubt it does remain the law. And it is very important to distinguish this from the situation pertaining to leasehold covenants, where both negative and positive covenants can run with the lease and the reversion, so in both law and equity. So this is one reason why it is very important to be sure what kind of covenant you are working with, leasehold or freehold, as the rules may be different. Now, the, pre the precise conditions for the passing of the burdens of restrictive covenants are discussed below. So there are five conditions. The covenant must be restrictive in nature. We're going to go through each of these in a moment, so don't worry too much. But the covenant must be restrictive in nature. The covenant must touch and concern the land. The covenant must have been imposed to benefit land of the original covenantee. The burden of the restrictive covenant must be intended to run with the land and registration. So let's look at them in turn. The covenant must be restrictive in nature. So as can be seen, determining whether something is a negative or a positive covenant is key to successfully analysing the legal rights. Determining whether something is a negative or positive covenant is always a matter of substance rather than form. So it doesn't matter what is actually phrased, it matters what is required or what is required not to do. Okay, It's, it's the substance. So in Tolkien Moxe, a covenant was expressed in terms of the need to keep land as an open space, and that was held rightly to be negative in substance because in reality it was a covenant not to build. So the second point is the covenant must touch and concern the land. It is axiomatic that only a covenant that relates to the use or value of the land should be capable of passing with a transfer of it. So it must be a proprietary interest and not an in personam interest. So we are concerned with matters affecting land, in other words, in rem, and not the personal preferences or desires of the parties. In practice, assessment of whether a covenant touches and concerns the land usually occurs in relation to the passing of the benefit of a covenant. This is because where a covenant confers a proprietary benefit on land, it is virtually inevitable that it also confers a proprietary burden. However, where the burden must be registered, uh, this may need to be proved separately. Okay, And whether a particular covenant touches and concerns the land will depend on the facts of each case too. And a useful three-part test about this was laid down by Lord Oliver in Swift Investments and Combined English Tours in 1989. And there were three questions he had to ask. Could the covenant impose a burden on any owner of an estate in the land as opposed to the particular original owner? 
does the covenant affect the nature quality manner of use or value of the land and thirdly is the covenant expressed to be personal so that regardless of its substance it is mean to operate only sorry it is meant to operate only as a promise binding the original covenant all and so that's a useful little three-part test that you can sort of ask yourself if you're in an exam and you have to sort of answer a problem question about the passing of a burden thirdly the covenant must have been imposed to benefit land of the original covenantee so very importantly the covenant must be of a nature to benefit the land of the original covenantee as a result the burden cannot pass at all unless the covenantee had land at the time the covenant was made and that the land was capable of benefiting from the covenant and the burden was imposed so as to benefit that land and that's from Whitgift Homes and Stocks 2001. So in other words the covenant must have been made to benefit land and if there is no benefit or no such land the covenant is unenforceable other than against the original covenant all. Fourthly the burden of the restrictive covenant must be intended to run with the land. So the burden of the restrictive covenant and remember only the burdens of restrictive covenants can pass must be intended to run with the land. So there must be some evidence that the burden was intended to be enforceable against whoever came into possession of the land. However, this is not actually that difficult to establish because in the absence of contrary intention, the burden of a restrictive covenant is deemed to be attached to the land, i.e. intended to run with the land, by virtue of section 79 of the Law of Property Act 1925. Okay? And this is known as the Article 79 presumption. And it says the following, a covenant relating to any land of a covenant or shall unless a contrary intention is expressed be deemed to be made by the by the covenant or on behalf of himself his successors in title and the persons deriving title under him or them so a rebuttable presumption that the burden is intended to run by operation of section 79 the burden of a covenant is deemed to be um, made by the original covenant tour on behalf of himself and all future owners of the land. So section 79 thereby operates to annex the burden of the covenant to that land due to the statutory presumption of an intention for it to run with the land. However, like any presumption, this may be rebutted. So section 79 you know, operates to annex the burden unless a contrary intention is expressed. It is clear that the covenant does not have to specifically refer to section 79 in order to exclude its effects too. A contrary intention may be found where there is the clear intention to exclude successors in title from the effect of the covenant. Of course, as this is a matter of construction for the court, the most certain course would be to explicitly exclude the operation of section 79 in the deed of the covenant itself. And finally, we have registration. So in short, in short, restrictive covenants are equitable interest in another's land and in consequence must comply with the rules of registered and unregistered conveyancing related to such interests. So where a person against whom the restrictive covenant is being enforced is a purchaser of a registered title under a properly registered disposition, the covenant must have been protected by the registration of a notice against the burdened property to be enforceable. And pursuant to section 29 of the Land Registration Act 2002, where such an interest is not registered, it loses its priority and cannot be enforced against the purchaser. So of course, in practice, most transferees of the burdened land will be purchasers and will be properly registered as the new estate owner and most restrictive covenants will have been protected by registration of a notice at the time they were created. But pursuant to section 20 of the Land Registration Act 2002, even if the interest is unregistered, it will still be enforceable against the transferee 
if the new proprietor is not a purchaser for valuable consideration, for example, the recipient of a gift, the devisee under a will, the adverse possessor, and where the purchaser obtains only an equitable interest, for example, an equitable tenant or a purchaser who fails to register his or her disposition. So in theory, section 29 allows that restrictive covenants may become overriding interests to pursue it to schedule three and so bind a disciplinary. And I have a video on overriding interests, so I'd recommend you check that one out. However, there is no paragraph in Schedule 3 under which covenants can fall, and the general overriding right in Paragraph 2 requires that claimants be in actual occupation, which is, of course, not relevant for covenants. As such, in practice, an overriding right of this kind is very unlikely to arise. Where the person, so with unregistered land, where the person against whom the covenant is enforced is a purchaser of the legal estate for money or money's worth, the covenant must have been registered against the original covenant or as a Class D2 land charge. And I've talked about land charges in my videos on unregistered land. Where the covenant is not registered, it will be void and unenforceable if the land is sold to a purchaser and cannot be revived by subsequent registration. However, even an unregistered restrictive covenant can be binding in unregistering, unregistered conveyancing in some circumstances. For example, against someone who is not a purchaser, for example, a giftee or a devisee under a will, uh, in a circumstance where against someone who does not give money or money's worth, for example, someone who's made a purchase through marriage consideration, and against someone who purchased only the equitable estate. Okay, so that one wraps up passing the burden of the covenant to successors as entitled. In the next video, we're going to be talking about passing the benefit to successors as entitled to the original covenantee and look at the specific criteria for that and like how can we how the burden of positive covenants can be enforced as well and a few other little things about restrictive covenants to wrap things up. But that's it for now. If you have any questions about this video and the contents of Restricted Covenants, please leave a comment below and I will get straight back to you. Make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching.